Hey, who's ready to get in the Word of God? Say aye. aye. All right. Well, this morning, I get to pick up where we left off in this series on personally seeking God, the habit of quiet times. When I was little, I have some memories going back to when I was three years old. Can any of you guys remember when you were three? Anyone have vivid memories? Okay. I want to make sure I'm not the only crazy one making stuff up, but I'm pretty sure I have some vivid memories when I was three. I remember um, living in this house in Singapore where my dad and mom were missionaries. I remember my red tricycle. I remember the neighbor boys standing on the back and pushing it really fast like a motorcycle. I remember one time we flipped over because we hit wet cement. I still have a scar to prove it right under my nostril. Looks a little bit like a booger. Uh, I remember my big sandbox. It felt huge when I was three years old. I remember exotic lizards from Singapore crawling around. I remember a kid who used to eat my Play-Doh. And I've never liked Play-Doh since then. I think I'm traumatized. Uh, if, you put, if you put Play-Doh near me, I'm, I, I start to gag. I don't like Play-Doh. And I blame it on that kid when I was three. I remember him eating my Play-Doh multiple times. It was weird. Uh, I remember... I remember my little, ty little tyke's uh, little car's uh, parking garage. I remember showing it to a doctor when he visited our house in Singapore. Okay, I have another memory. I remember I used to come out of my room as a little boy, and I had to be three because I remember the house, and we were living in Singapore at the time. And I come out, it was dark, and I see my dad in the living room, sitting there with his bowl of cereal, his coffee, and his Bible, and saying, Dad, Dad, is it midnight? And, it must have been like my ambition to come out of my room at midnight and either wake up my dad to find out or I don't know. It's weird. That was my dream as a kid because now as a parent, it's like my nightmare as my kids waking us up. <laughs> but it was my dream to see, you know, wake up at midnight and my dad would say, no, it's not midnight. Good morning, Josh. And uh, I remember sitting with my dad and he would read his Bible and I don't know what I'd do, probably eat cereal and play with my little toys. Um, but I remember as far as three years old, vivid memories of my dad with his Bible on his lap, seeking the Lord in the dark hours of the morning. I remember when we moved to uh, 13th Street, Los Osos, I remember I had a bunk bed made of wood. It was really creaky. I don't know if it was safe, but it was my bunk bed. And uh, my dad, I remember my dad, we had the talk one time. I was probably 10, maybe 11 years old. And the talk, you guys, I don't know if you know what the talk is. It's not where babies come from, the stork. Uh, at my house, the talk is, hey, son, hey, daughter, hey, friend, you're, you're old enough to start having your own personal daily quiet time. I remember my, da my dad got me a blue children's Bible, not, not with the pictures, but like, you know, legit Bible, says what your Bible says, but has a, little, a couple of little pictures, not a lot. It was a legit Bible, the same, you know, it wasn't abridged, making up, filling in the blanks. It was a real Bible. I was probably 10 or 11. My dad sat with me and showed me how to start each day. I could open the Bible and you know, start in the New Testament or the Psalms and, and pray to God and read a little bit and pray to God and read a little bit. I had a little spot right between my mattress and the wooden frame of that bunk bed where I'd stick that blue Bible. I remember waking up and reading it. I remember when I was a teenager, like 15, I remember uh, my parents started using our rooms to house people a lot at our house. I didn't have my own room anymore. There's always a, a guy in my room. My parents let one of my friends lived with us, and a, a guy who was a youth pastor here lived with us, and a boy who needed a house, he was homeless, lived with us. Everyone was living with us, one at a time. Not too many. I'm, not, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but one time I didn't have my own room. Multiple times I didn't have my own room, and we had this little laundry room. It had a couple washing machines in it, or, and I'd, uh, I remember escaping into that room. That became my hideout when I was 15, 16. Uh, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit at a summer camp, and... Um, I just remember being on fire. I remember I'd go in there before high school. I'd go in that little laundry room sometimes when my mom would have the machines going in the morning and I'd just open my Bible. And she gave me a real Bible with a leather cover. I remember it still. Uh, and it had red letters. And I, I fell in love with the red letters, 16 years old, reading them in, my, in the laundry room, reading about Jesus. And right up until I had to run out and catch the bus and make it to high school. And I remember then I, I, was, uh, I was pretty on fire. I'd go tell everyone about Jesus and tell my teachers about Jesus, tell the principal about Jesus, tell the seagulls about Jesus. I just tell everyone about Jesus. I was just on fire. And I remember, though, every morning just getting filled up, looking at the words of Jesus and then taking it with me. I remember hanging out with my buddy Keith, talking to Keith about Jesus. I remember talking to the basketball friends in the locker room about Jesus. I remember being on the bus talking about Jesus. I just remember. But I, but I can't forget those morning times where my mom was up 
in her room with her Bible out. My dad was somewhere hiding with his Bible out. And I was in the laundry room with my Bible out. I just remember it was a normal thing in my house growing up is that we start the day seeking the Lord. I don't, I never really got the sense that it was like a, a legalistic thing. I, I don't think it was a, a, a shameful thing. I think it was an exciting thing. You know what I remember? It was kind of a sacred thing. I, I remember I didn't, my parents, my sister, everyone kind of knew not to come in somebody's room, not to interrupt. There's like a reverence around this, this quiet time, this daily habit. It was sacred. It was reverent. Um, and it was normal. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is this, this habit of seeking God personally and privately. Uh, there's a lot of Christianese words for it, phrases, ways we refer to it. People call it their time with the Lord, their devotional time, time seeking the Lord, time alone with God. I hear pe- some of my friends abbreviate it. They call it their TWL, time with the Lord. It's all kinds of different ways people refer to Whatever it is, but it's personally and privately being alone to seek God. And I would say it's a a good habit. I would say it's a a normal habit for a Christian. That's what I would say. Uh, Just thinking about habits a lot lately. My wife and I, we read a book, listened to a book, Atomic Habits. It's kind of popular. I might have listened to another popular one about the science of habits and a habit's kind of a, a trending topic right now. People are talking about habits. They're saying out with goals and in with habits. They're saying goals are overrated, saying habits are underrated. People are saying the science shows that goals aren't really cracked up to be much. They're, they're not, they don't really make a long-term difference. Goals just help you achieve something short-term and, and then move on. But habits and systems is where it's at. They say they can prove to you that people who implement good systems in their life will have good outcomes in their life. They say people who just pursue a goal, that's all it'll be. They'll pursue a goal. They might plateau. They might hit their goal. They might fail, but they just end up in these weird cycles. But they say the better thing is just put little little atomic, atom-sized habits in your life. I don't know. I think that's kind of cool. I learned more things from that book. They said uh, little, little tricks and tips. They said try to habit bundle. They said when you're brushing your teeth, do your calf raises. They say when you're flossing your teeth, do your calf stretches, stuff like that. I do all that. Say when you're driving. No, just kidding. Don't do anything when you're driving. I'd be a bad pastor if I told you I do other things while I'm driving. Uh, just focus on driving. But uh, they say to bundle habits if you really want to be effective and you want to remind yourself to put good systems in place. All right. So I get there's a lot of tips. There's a lot of tricks. But I don't know. Sometimes when we talk about habits as Christians, I don't know. I feel like I might trigger people. I feel like I might, uh, I might cross a line. I feel like I might be inching towards a boundary because as Christians, we're really careful not to preach a gospel of works. And I don't know, something about habit sounds like a work. Habit sounds like an action. Action sounds like a work. And isn't works like the dichotomy of grace? Am I crossing the line? I don't know. I've been thinking about that lately. It's really interesting. Uh, I think... Uh, I think we do face some dangers when we talk about works and actions. Everyone watch your toes. Whiteboard coming through. I think any time we approach works, actions, or habits apart from God's habits, God's works, and God's actions, then, then we fall into error. But I think if we start with the gospel and what Jesus did for us and what his finished work was on the cross... I think it creates a safe place for us to talk about our works and our actions. I feel like I'm not giving you the whole story if I only tell you what Jesus did, if I only tell you what he did for you, if I only tell you about him pursuing you, but I don't talk at all about you pursuing him back. Uh, I've kind of illustrated it like this before, that when God rescues us, he actually rescues us out of Satan's kingdom. That's what the Bible says, Satan's domain. And he takes you and you were not happy then, and he rescues you into God's kingdom. This is God's, uh, God's kingdom. And, um, and that's purely the work of God. The Bible teaches us that's the gift of salvation. Can't be earned, can't be achieved. You can't prove yourself to God. There's nothing you can do to rescue yourself. There's no self-help therapy, spiritualism, religion. Only Jesus 
God came to earth. God came to the cross. God died. He rose again. He rescued us so we could come into his kingdom. But here's kind of what I want to tell you. Getting into the kingdom can be the extent of it. And the tragedy is we can really settle for just a, a fringe life in God's kingdom. And I think that's a bit of a tragedy because the Bible paints the picture of this kingdom being this limitless, wonderful uh, realm, experience, dimension, uh, home, and, and place and thing for us to explore, to experience, um, and to seek after. And, and I think it's kind of like, here's I was thinking of it like this. If I got married, which I did, and I had a wedding, and I made the wedding the highlight, the apex of my marriage, how sad would that be? No, there's no doubt the wedding was important, and we had a wedding, and we got married. But how sad would that be if I said that was it? We got married, I told her I love her, and if I ever change my mind, I'll tell you. That would just be a really uh, unsatisfying uh, you know, it, it would just be like living on the fringe of what's available in that marriage. I think it's the same with Jesus. He no doubt rescued us by his works. Okay? And, and I think we need to get that. But how do I say this? If we're getting triggered every time the pastor talks about works, habits, or actions, the issue is probably not the pastor. The issue might be that we need a more secure identity in who we are as a royal and rescued child of God. That might be the issue. Uh, and I, I just feel like I need to say that because I, I, I want to be sensitive, emotionally sensitive to people who have real triggers. And hey, I've been in the legalistic church and I was in the legalistic family and I grew up Jehovah's Witness and I grew up in the Catholic school. I, I understand all those things really do create some bad uh, mentalities towards God. I get that. Uh, but in the same way, you need to go deeper in your identity in Jesus until that is secure. And there absolutely is a wonderful and liberating place for works, actions, and habits on our part. So I want to say that today. I, I think that part of exploring the fullness of God's kingdom and a relationship with the king has much to do with habits, with habits. I'm going to use alliteration today. I'm going to use H's. I'm going to talk about five things. I'll start with H in relation to uh, our daily time, our personal, privately seeking God. Uh, as we're talking about habits, that, that's, the first, that's the first H, um, that seeking God absolutely is a habit. And I realize s some of you in this room, you're probably saying, Josh, not for me. I've been seeking God my whole life. I just wake up, and it's the only thing I think about is Jesus. And I just want to tell you that's awesome, but at the beginning, at some point, for most people, it starts as a habit. It starts as a habit um, to set other things aside and set God first and set our minds on Him, and prepare ourselves to seek Him. It absolutely is a habit. And I would tell you today, if you're feeling like, man, I have some bad habits, and that is one habit I don't have. I'm going to give you good news. This is a habit you absolutely can have. And Jesus has all the power for you to adopt this habit in your life. And maybe you're feeling some guilt already. Maybe you didn't want to come today because you're like, great, pastor's just going to lay more shoulds. He's going to just should on me more and more and more. And should do this, should do that. Josh, Always telling me what I should do. Well, you know what? That's, that's part of it today. It's not the whole thing. God has strength to help you with seeking Him. Even if you feel like you've had a bad experience in the past, there's some negativity around this, I think this is the year God wants to set things right. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about habits since this is the first H. Let's turn to some scripture. Mark chapter 1 says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Later, the gospel writer Luke, in chapter 5, verse 16, says, But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Um, some of the translations actually do use the word habit and tell us that it was Jesus' habit. Um, so here we see habit is not a dirty word for a Christian. It's a good word. And I realize habit might... You might start thinking, oh boy, I've got some bad habits. Well, Christians also adopt good habits. And I want to say that is the focus uh, of the Christian's life, is these good habits. You know, you might be thinking, oh boy, I, Josh, before I work on seeking God, I need to cut out sugar and all the booze and the caffeine, and I need to quit skipping leg day at the gym. And you know what? I, there, I've been missing a lot of, you know, let me, let me say, I feel like there's some habits that if we get these habits in place, a lot of other habits start to take care of themselves. 
That might sound really small thinking, and I'm not trying to minimize bad habits, but I, I, I remember Jesus said, watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. So I really think the, the key, the antidote to lots of our temptations for bad habits is seeking God. I really do. And it was his habit. Okay, I want to tell you something else. Um, in this book I, I referenced, it's not a Christian book. It's called Atomic Habits. Um, one thing they were trying to break down is that what they found is that people who uh, put systems in their life, habits in their life, protocols that are on repeat, that they, uh, if they're goal-oriented, they tend to be less effective. But if they're identity-focused, they tend to be more effective. And as I read that, what he meant by that is that when people, here's what he says as the author, is when people implement systems, repetitive habits in their life, um, and they're just focused on meeting some kind of goal, it's not effective, but when they're trying to shape their identity, form their identity, it's much more powerful. So if, here's what I'm going to say. If you're ready to live a life without Jesus, that's your key. Go get that book. But here's what I want to say. As Christians, we actually don't believe that you can form your own identity. We don't believe that anymore. We believe that your identity can only be received and believed as a gift from their father. It's not something you can form. It's not something you can shape. It's not something you can choose. It's not something you can earn, achieve. It's not your job. It's not your status. It's not your appearance. It's not your friends. It's not your future. It's not your past. It's a gift from your father. You become a rescued and royal child of God. You become in Christ and an heir of everything that you get through Jesus. You get this royal identity. You can't make it. You can only receive it. So here's what I, what I say about habits then, because I still want to take this concept, because I think it's really powerful, is that your habits reinforce your identity. They don't form your identity as a Christian, but they reinforce your identity. Yeah, I like that. That's good preaching. Praise the Lord. That was good. I'm ready to work on my habits because they reinforce our identity. They remind us of our identity. They ground us in our true identity. And habits, such as seeking God, grow our relationship. It's the same with a marriage. I wouldn't just think that a wedding was enough to have a successful marriage. I need, I need some habits. I need some systems. I need some good things on repeat. I need a date night. I need some time where the kids stay out of our space. I need some time just to focus, have conversation. We need a vacation every once in a while. We need some good uh, conversation starters. We need some lifelines when we're stuck on something, someone who can help us. We need some good systems. All right, well, that was the first H. The next one I want to teach you about is your hideout. What's your hideout? Where is your hideout? What's it look like? Jesus had a hideout. You might say, oh, no, Jesus, he, he, just, um, he just went around with his disciples. That's not what it tells us. It says he had a habit of slipping away. And in the context, it was him hiding from his, from his distractions, which were people, <laughs> which was his ministry, helping people. That was his hideout. The Bible tells us Jesus himself, our model, our Lord, he slipped away and he had a hideout. He had spots he would go in the woods. He had places he would go to pray and be alone with the Father. Thinking about your hideout, do you have a hideout? Do you have an environment that is suitable for seeking the Lord? You know, I was thinking about some, man, I like letters. I'm going with alliteration this morning. I think a hideout should, ha should be a private place. I think a hideout should be somewhere where there's protective protocols. And I think a hideout should be somewhere where there's product productive props. Let me explain each of these. A private place. Jesus said, when you pray... Speaking about your habits. He said, go into your inner room is how most of the Bibles translate it. I looked it up this morning. You know what the inner room was? It was usually a storage room. It's like a pantry, a storage room. Doesn't sound very comfy to me. If I was going to go seek the Lord, I'd, I like a cushion. I like a heater. I like some, some warm liquids like coffee. Uh, you know, I'll tolerate a washing machine next to me, but I don't want to be in the pantry. You know, I don't want all those distractions. That's what Jesus said. He said, go into the inner room. And, and I noticed where they use that word, other places in the New Testament, it's speaking about like a pantry, a storage room. And then it says there's a door and it says, close the door behind you. There's a hideout. Jesus is implying that when you seek the Lord, he wants you to be in private, a private place. Next, I believe Jesus wants us to have private, protective protocols. I think he wants us to treat our time with him as sacred and reverent. I think he wants us to treat it 
like it's a temple. I know, I know you could say, but Josh, we're the temple. I know. But I think there's something very holy about setting our time aside to just seek him alone. He wants us to have protective protocols. That might be hard for you. You might say, there's a lot of distractions in my life. I, I'm a mom, and I've got a baby, and I've got two kids, I've got three kids, and they all need diapers and milk and snacks. And I'm a dad, and I've got people from work calling me, and I've got people from, I don't know, my business calling me. I've got customers calling me. I've got friends trying to text me. Um, you know what? Protective protocols are necessary. Jesus said, close the door. And I think if he was in this room today, he'd say, turn off your phone. I say he, he might say, put it in a drawer. He might say, don't use YouTube. He might say, don't use your podcast yet. He might say, don't text your buddies yet. I think Jesus might address our phone because that is one of our biggest distractions these days in 2024. I think he would say, if you're, you've got kids, I think Jesus would say, um, uh, i got to be careful here. Um, I think Jesus would say, there's a way. I think Jesus would say, there's a way. We can do this. Don't give up. I think Jesus would say, moms, don't give up on seeking the Lord. We can do this. And I realize, babies, you know, I've, I wanted to bring you some of my, protoc- my productive props. We'll get to that next. But, um, oh, I, okay. So here's one of them. Here's one of my protective protocols. Um, I use these. I use these often. If you've ever seen me um, anywhere throughout the week, you've probably seen these around my neck or even on my head. And I use them, and um, they're very nice because they turn down the volume of your mouth. It's amazing. I have like a dial. No, sorry, you didn't get it. It was supposed to be a joke. That didn't go over very well. These turn down the volume on all of life. It's amazing. I can still hear people, um, but everything is quieter. It's really amazing. I can also, Bluetooth, put on some very uh, non-distracting instrumental music. I like soaking music a lot. Uh, There's certain songs that are too distracting, too many words, but there's songs that really help me seek the Lord and stay undistracted. I've got some protective protocols. This is one of my uh, productive props. I keep this on my nightstand. I was going to tell, I was going to tell you to do the same thing. If if someone in this room, you're like, I don't even know where my Bible is. I lose it. I was going to encourage you to buy another one and have multiple Bibles. I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, When we were trying to read the children's Jesus storybook Bible to our kids, we bought a lot of them and we put them in every room so that we won't forget to read them to our kids. There's one on my nightstand. So that if I get interrupted in my quiet time, the kids know the first thing we do is we read the Bible together. Um, I've got productive props. I like coffee. I like a water bottle. And that's about it. I don't need much else. Um, when we got married, uh, this became you know, a little challenging. Our first house was one room, literally one room. And um, you know, I'd never lived in a house with just one room. But I learned to love it. I learned to like it. I actually wished I could live there forever. Uh, but my wife has a bad habit of getting pregnant and having babies, so <laughs> somebody please talk to her about that. So we had to move because that room didn't have, that room house didn't have enough rooms for all the babies she keeps having. So, uh, but I miss that house. But what we would do is uh, we would separate. She'd go, you know, inside, I'd go outside, and there's a little porch and a little chair, and we would seek the Lord separately. And we, tr- we treated that time as sacred. We established that from the beginning of our marriage. And when we had kids, we would find ways. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not, I'm not shaming anyone who has kids. It's hard to protect that time. But I don't want you to give up on it either. I don't want you to give up. I realize it requires some work. All right, I want to talk to you real quick on the topic of hideout about the word distractions. How many of you have distractions in your life? Can anyone raise your hand with me? All right, cool. Makes me feel good because I guess I'm not alone. So distractions. I think there's categories of distractions. I wanted to just make some reference to this right now. I think there's some blurred lines, and I don't think uh, we always should call everything a distraction. I think we should label them differently. Similar to mistakes. How many of you guys ever make mistakes? Anyone make mistakes? Okay, good. Sometimes we use that word a lot. I'm just going to say there's things like an affair that lasts for five years is not a mistake. (laughs) That would be an example of a a bad choice. There might have been mistakes that led up to a five-year affair. But that's not, in my opinion, a mistake. Oh, I made a mistake. The Bible calls that adultery, unfaithfulness, infidelity. There's other labels for things besides mistake. And I'm not shaming anyone. I know Jesus forgives sins of all kinds of mistakes. I'm just saying sometimes we call something a mistake, and it's not really the right word. Like, we knew what we were doing. We meant to do it. We made a choice, and we made the choice over and over again. All right, I think it's the same with distractions. 
I don't think it's always the best thing. I think sometimes we cut ourselves maybe a little too much rope, and we should label a distraction what it really is. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible does talk about distractions. It says your marriage is a distraction. <laughs> it actually says intimacy with your spouse is a distraction from prayer. I have a hard time with that one, but it says that. It says that you're supposed to so guard over your time seeking the Lord and even fasting that that's one thing that's not supposed to come into the way during set-aside time for seeking the Lord. So the Bible does say there's distractions. We'll, we'll cover that a different time. You're like, whoa, what is the pastor saying? I don't, uh, yeah, we'll cover that a different time. The point is there are distractions. There's also things that um, the Bible doesn't call distractions. It calls them other things. For instance, in Genesis 35, when uh, Jacob, he is uh, repenting. And he's turning away from the bad choices he made and the terrible place he led his family into and all the sons and daughters and all the terrible things that happened to them. Uh, for instance, his daughter, she got raped. Just absolutely terrible. Never want to blame anyone, but dad wasn't doing his best job. And that's what the Bible shows us. Um, and then his sons go and murder all the men in a city. And I know it seems, sounds like, well, yeah, Liam Neeson got revenge, and so should, so should he. No, that's actually not what should have happened. The sons should have found a better way to deal with the tragedy that happened in their family. Um, and their murder almost made uh, their family a target for, for soldiers and armies to come against them. So it tells us that God's, when God starts speaking to Jacob, that Jacob repented. And here's what happens. It says, Jacob told everyone in his household, get rid of all your pagan idols. Actually calls it idols. Doesn't call them distractions. Your foreign gods, purify yourselves, put on clean clothing. We're going to Bethel now. We're going to build an altar to God, the one who answered our prayers. Um, and it says the kids gave all their idols, the earrings, and they buried them under the tree. And it says that basically uh, once they buried their idols, um, God protected their family. God protect, supernaturally brought protection on his family. It says God put a terror from God that spread over all the people so no one attacked Jacob's family. And then they built an altar. And uh, so I don't know. I feel like we should just realize some distractions in our life absolutely are distractions. They're good things. They're blessings from God. They're responsibilities. And I think some things are idols too. And I feel like it's good for us. Uh, I don't know. I just felt like I should share that. That's a harder word. But idols are something we renounce, denounce, and repent of. Not label as distractions. Um, yeah, you know what else? I think, uh, I think some, I want to tell you this. Sometimes when we're seeking the Lord, a distraction is a burden. Something that's heavy on our heart. Uh, something that we're worried about, concerned about, stressed up to. Bring those. I tell you, those, you might be calling those distractions. God may not. God may want you to bring those to him in your time alone with him. He may want to discuss your burdens more than you realize. Those may not be distractions. They may be an invitation for deeper communion and for yieldedness. All right. Um, now I want to talk about, since we talked about the hideout and distractions, I want to talk about the heart. So Jesus addressed uh, what he wants our heart to look like when we come before him to seek him in this habit. And the main thrust when I'm reading uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, is that Jesus wants us to come before him with a sincere, genuine, and pure heart. And he contrasts us, uh, this heart, to the Pharisees' heart. And the Pharisees, when they would pray, Jesus said they, they want to be noticed. They want to be seen. They want to be heard by men. And Jesus says, that's, uh, that's not the heart I want you to have. Um, he says, what the Father sees you do in secret, the Father will reward. Um, hey, you guys, is this, is this too much information? Did I start overloading? You guys doing okay? Okay. Cool. So um, what we want when we're seeking God is to posture our heart, to prepare our heart to seek Him. And I think the first thing is to examine our motives and try to come to this pure motive of seeking God for God. Not just what he'll do for us, though he will do things for us as we seek him. Uh, we want to seek him for him, not for any other reason. The word tells us to have a thankful heart in all of our prayers with thanksgiving. Uh, the word 
teaches us to have a surrendered and yielded heart, tells us to cast our burdens on him and to ask him for wisdom and guidance. Uh, Matthew 11 tells us to have a forgiving heart when we come before God. When you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, that your Father, which is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Mark 11, 25. Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down while you're angry and don't give the devil a foothold. Um, our, our daily time of seeking the Lord is so important because God wants to help us live in this constant state of forgiveness where we release people, people who maybe offended us recently or maybe people who even hurt us a long time ago and we haven't let it go. We haven't released them through forgiveness. And then one more thing about our heart is that Jesus tells us if you're giving your, your offering, he speaks of giving a gift at the altar. It's a little, maybe a little different, but I think similar. And if you remember someone has something against you, uh, Jesus tells us to go and be reconciled, to seek reconciliation. So this is kind of about how we posture our heart. Okay, I have just a couple more things. And then uh, I want to sing a song, offer communion. Uh, a couple more points. The next H is the highlight. So this one, uh, what is the highlight of our time with the Lord? And... Um, you might say, well, the highlight is God's presence. The highlight is the peace that comes into my heart. Or here's what I felt the Lord uh, whispering to me this week is, the highlight is whatever he highlights. The highlight is whatever he highlights. Um, and this is a spin. This is not so much going into our time with the Lord um, oriented towards what he'll give us, but what towards he wants to say, and what he wants to speak. And this is my encouragement to everyone this year, and I even want to encourage parents with kids to help your kids, whether they're grown adults or little kids, to learn to read the Bible with the expectation that God, through Holy Spirit, will highlight what he wants to highlight. And I'm, I'm believing over our time seeking the Lord that the highlight is whatever he highlights. The highlight is whatever he highlights. God wants to speak. He wants to guide you. Uh, he wants to illuminate things. And uh, maybe you're saying, well, hey, God doesn't speak to me very much. Well, just start by opening the word then and praying back to God and seeing what feels like he might, might be highlighted. That might be your way of learning to hear God's voice this year. Okay, and then the last H I want to share is the hope. The hope. Sometimes we do things and there's not an immediate reward. Sometimes we really do as Christians. I wanted to, to share that. Sometimes you might not feel a big difference when you seek the Lord. You might feel like you got behind on your day. I didn't get the answer I was looking for. I still have some unresolved things in my life. And I wanted to share that there's a lot of hope that we can hold on to when we're seeking the Lord. One is that um, God is working inside of us, that he is shaping our character. Um, the Bible tells us that he is pruning those who love him and serve him. And that if we're abiding in him, the Father is faithful to prune us that we'll be more fruitful. It's another hope if you're saying, I feel like my life just doesn't have a lot of fruitfulness right now. I just feel like it's a struggle. I don't feel like I'm producing enough. Uh, that's something you can hold a vibrant hope for, is that as we seek the Lord, God is faithful to produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit uh, and the fruit of our works, that'll come. Fruit of um, the actions that He will lead you to. Uh, I want to share one more hope. And this comes from a scripture. It's in Isaiah. It was read last week as well. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Um, so this is a prophecy, and many people believe that this is uh, partially fulfilled in Jesus, that he was one prophesied about here, that he was the one being uh, wakened by the Father and being uh, given uh, guidance as Jesus would minister to people. And I wanted to share that with you as well, that um, I, I don't think Christianity works without an outward orientation. I really don't. And I, I really want to share this as like a warning. I think I've observed so many times where um, well-meaning Christians get stuck on seeking the Lord. And they say it's not working, it's not connecting, there's something, it's just not meeting me at the level I need. And I wanted to ask you to turn your orientation maybe outward a bit 
And I know that can, I know we can be, go too far with this, but I want to ask you, when you go to seek the Lord, I want you to go with an orientation that he'll minister to you, but also very much prepare you to minister through you to others. I really think that Christianity cannot be separated from our outward orientation to minister the life, the power, the hope, the, the love of Jesus to other people every day. And I think as you seek the Lord, he wants to awaken you and guide you and speak to you so that you may sustain the weary ones. So you will be uh, prepared to give an account uh, to those that you meet in your day to day life. I really believe that. I remember, like I told you, sitting next to the noisy washing machine as a teenager and uh, reading the red letters and just getting ready to go to go to high school and just getting pumped to share with Jesus. And I realized that someone might be saying, well, Josh, that's an impure motive. That's a ministry idol. That's a focus. And I don't think it is so much. I don't think it is so much. I think it's part of the hope of a life in Christ, that it'll flow to us and through us to others.